can see you there. Come closer, come closer. We want to tell you all about us. Yes, we want to tell you about the wonderful world of Ukiyo-e. So, uh, what does Ukiyo-e mean anyways? Well, Ukiyo-e is Japanese for pictures of the floating world. They're woodblock prints that gained popularity throughout the Edo period in the late 17th century. Watani-san, well, can you tell us more about Edo Japan? That I can. Simply put, Edo Japan was under the control of the Tokugawa shogunate and the warrior class, even if the emperor was still the symbolic leader of the country. This government created rigid social hierarchy in which the common class was divided among four groups. The warrior class, followed by the farmers, then the artisans, and finally the merchants. The merchants were the lowest class because they did not produce any goods on their own. They accumulated wealth by trading goods created by others. Exactly. Ukiyo is actually a response to this rigid social structure. Merchants became very rich, richer than the warrior class. However, in order to maintain the hierarchy, merchants were subject to many laws, like the restrictions against the purchase and consumption of luxury goods that may have made them appear richer than the warrior class. Still, afraid of fostering too much resentment, the Tokugawa shogunate allowed the merchant class to keep certain pleasures, like brothels and kabuki theater. This subculture of entertainment became known as ukiyo, the floating world, and was a central and recurring theme of early ukiyo-e. But there's so much ukiyo-e that doesn't show kabuki or brothels. Everybody knows the great wave off of Kanagawa, but that's a landscape piece. It barely has any people in it. How can we explain that? Well, another interpretation of the word ukiyo is the here and the now. In this sense, ukiyo depicts scenes of everyday life. Let's explore a few common themes. Oh, kabuki actors, just like me! Yeah, kabuki was a common theme, especially in early ukiyo-e. Ukiyo artists were commissioned by kabuki houses to advertise their plays and actors, and actors were often depicted in their famous mia pose. In this painting, we can see another feature of early ukiyo-e. There are no colors. In the fabrics, we can also see a flatness that is characteristic of all ukiyo-e due to the woodblock process. Hmm, ah, that's true. The patterns don't really match with the folds of the fabric. <laughs> These next ones also have no color. They illustrate another very popular theme of ukiyo-e, eroticism. Many explicit scenes are depicted in erotic ukiyo-e, but nudity did not always translate as being sexual since nudity was not regarded as taboo. Also, if you compare these two pieces, you can see that they share the same frame. Right, right. The artist must have used the same woodblock to save time. After all, ukiyo-e was a very competitive industry. And some artists even had blocks for stock figures and faces. Huh, <laughs> this couple seems to only have begun. The samurai has not yet put down his sword. This next piece shows the theme of women and daily life. The first colors available for ukiyo artists were red, green, and blue. Yellow and pink came very shortly after. Yeah, well, the color doesn't seem very even. That's because color was still being applied by hand at this point. Using blocks to apply color didn't become common until the 1750s. And this next piece... Oh my Buddha, who is she? Well, someone from the pleasure quarters, it looks like. The line work of her hair is so fine. Isn't she beautiful? Ukiyo artists did love to paint beauty in all its shapes and forms, including women. Common people were painted with the same grace as nobles. Such artworks often set the fashion for the time. Textile printers would often go to ukiyo prints for inspiration. This next piece illustrates two more important themes of ukiyo landscapes and animals. Oh, I recognize this artist. It's Hiroshige and his series of 100 views of famous places in Edo. Right, this piece also shows a new coloring development. By dampening the paper before applying the ink, artists became able to manipulate the layering, blending, and transparency of colors. This final ukiyo illustrates the theme of myth and heroes. Do you recognize the characters? Of course! Is Yoshitsune and Benkei fighting on the Gojo Bridge? Exactly! One reason why ukiyo became so popular is because of its storytelling ability. The Edo audience wanted narrative pictures, but stories were commonly depicted in scrolls or on paper screens, which were both time-consuming and costly, and they often required you to read to understand the story. But by using a common folktale, ukiyo made storytelling an accessible form of art. Well, after all this talk about art, it made me want to do art too. I tried my hand at painting a ukiyo style landscape. Oh cool! How did that go? At first, I wanted to follow the same techniques they did. But I soon found out that it was very time and labor intensive. Ukiyo prints were not a one man job. It usually took three or more people just to make the final print. First, an artist would sketch out a piece of art, sometimes detailed, 
sometimes it was just general guidelines. A wood carver would then stick the sketch on a block of wood, usually cherry wood because it was very durable. They would then carve out the negative spaces and sometimes finalize designs as well. Initially, ukiyo-e prints were black and white and they would go straight to the publisher for mass production. As color became more popular, however, additional wood blocks were needed to stamp on colors as well. The color stamping was to be done all at once to allow the colors to mix and to minimize the warping of the paper. These inks were water-based and came from various sources. Colors were not decided by the initial artist or the woodcarver, but by a third artist. A typical style for ukiyo-e coloring was the use of color gradients, especially for the water or the sky. Many printings of the same piece could mean colors would vary between prints. Sometimes publishers would save time and money by omitting certain colors in the reprintings of a print. Oh my gosh, what a process. So how did your ukiyo-e come out? Here it is. I still have a long way to go in terms of composition, though. We hope you enjoyed and learned a little something from this episode of Art History. Tune in next week for an episode all about 19th century Impressionism in France.